Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Benno Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And today I'm talking with Walter Martin. Uh, Some of you probably know this. Actually, a lot of you probably know that Walter Martin was in the band The Walkmen, which went on extended hiatus in 2013. And since then, he has uh, put out six solo albums, and this is his sixth. It comes out March 25th. It is called The Bear. Uh, I have been listening to it for the past couple of weeks, and it is fantastic. It is also the first uh, album that he put out since moving his family to upstate New York in July 2020. I spent five years in upstate New York, in Hamilton, New York, and it is really cold up there. It's gorgeous, but it's really, really, really cold, and it snows a lot. Uh, And Walter lives, uh, I think, outside of Albany, and he um, recently redid uh, an 1800s uh, farmhouse on the property converted it into a studio and look on the pictures on Instagram. It's gorgeous. The thing is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, we did this uh, over video, um, but the backdrop behind him is just a stunning uh, interior. So uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, that stood out to me in the interview. One, he mentioned that he gets a lot of good writing done when he's hungover. And that's not the first time a songwriter has told me that, that they find that being hungover is a great state to write in. I can't remember who else has told me that, but a lot of them have. Um, And I can't really figure out why, because when you're hungover, your head hurts. And I don't know how you feel like doing, doing anything in that state. And we try to kind of pin down what it is about being hungover that makes it so conducive to creativity. He talked about maybe there being some residual alcohol still in the system, so you're not drunk, but you still have a little bit of looseness to the thought. Um, I can only maybe theorize that your head hurt, and I, I have heard other songwriters tell me this, that your head hurts and you're just, but you're aware of your head. You're not really thinking about any other, th- your anything in the environment but you're just, you're in your head because your head hurts and that's all you're thinking about. It makes you focus. I don't know. Uh, that's all I can think of, but he is not the first one to tell me that. And, um, I just found that to be very interesting. So that's the first thing. The second thing is his love of poetry. And, uh, I thought that was amazing. Um, I could probably count on one hand, the number of songwriters who tell me they like poetry. And that always kind of fascinates me because you would think that people who write lyrics would be fans of lyrics on the page, but so few of them read poetry. I mean, so few, I've interviewed 200 songwriters and so few tell me they like poetry. Uh, We mentioned who are some of his favorites. You'll, you'll hear a Charles Simmet comes up uh, and and, uh, some others as well. Uh, Raymond Carver is a short story writer, and I, I think we identified how the simplicity of the language in their writing really uh, is attractive to uh, Walter as a songwriter and his lyrics as well. But I love that. I wish more songwriters read poetry. Um, and so that's a big part of his process as well. And visual art, he majored in art history in college, and so we talked about how uh, the role that visual art, uh, looking at visual art plays in his songwriting process. So that's it again, March 25th, his studio album, the bear comes out, pick it up. Uh, it is fantastic. Uh, one thing to note about this interview, I had to do this in our basement because our neighbors decided to bring in a tree service to chop down a massive tree next door. So the saws were rather loud so I had to go into our basement to where the Wi-Fi isn't quite as strong. And uh, Walter's audio is fine. That's all that really matters. But there are moments where my questions sound a little wacky. Uh, you can understand me, but I just wanted to be aware of that going into this. But again, you want to hear me, him, not me. So just uh, if you hear my voice sound 
a little a little strange during the questions. That is why it's because of the Wi-Fi. It will not happen again as long as our neighbors don't decide to do this, but just want you be, to be aware of that. So with that, let's enjoy my interview with Walter Martin. I guess my first question is, how important is it for you to create in some fashion every day? You know, is some artists say that it's important to do something, others say no, don't push it. But where do you fall in that as far as just, you know, as an artist creating on a daily basis? Well, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say I sit down at my desk and write every day. You know, I, I definitely don't. I, uh, I, I, it's more that I, I sort of, I think I take a lot of notes, you know, I, thankfully like the, the, the phone and the voice memo that's always in my pocket. I mean, the, the memo machine that's always in my pocket. I'm able to really like, you know, that helps so much. I, so I, I feel like in that way, I am, it is working. I am writing because I'm, you know, th those are th th those ideas that come to me when I'm not, I rarely am sitting at my desk and I'm like, oh, this is, I'm going to write this. You know, it's, it's more like I, I think of a funny idea or I think of like a phrase or a title or something when I'm driving or like mowing the lawn. And so it's those things that become like the, like the real heart of the matter. So in that way, I, yeah, I do do that every day. But it's not necessarily, it's more of a passive way of, of you know, sort of getting, getting ideas uh, organized. Yeah, and there's some songwriters that tell me that if you force it, it becomes derivative, right? That if you just, if you insist on, oh, I've got to do something, that's just, it becomes derivative after a while. Well, yeah, I don't know, derivative, it would, it, but like, um, it can be, I can get to it in my head and it can come from the wrong place. It can come from me trying to act like I'm smart or act like <laughs> I'm like a poet or something like that. You know, uh, if I'm, if I'm like, you know, writing, you know, really trying to have made a decision that I'm writing today and I'm I need, I'm writing a song that's going to have whatever. It, it doesn't work for me that way. I, it has to, I have to have an idea that has come from sort of a more and more organic place. And then I, once I have that, I can, and, I, and I feel like it's an idea that I can work with, then yeah, I'll sit down and write, but I try not to, yeah, I, I try not to force it too much. Yeah. So I have, I was going to ask this later, but since you brought it up, you brought up mow mowing the lawn and I am fascinated by the role of movement that plays uh, in the, the creative process. So we can do this in a, you know, there's a lot of things, right? Some people t say driving, that's pretty obvious. Um, I've read, actually written articles in the Washington Post about the role that uh, aerobic exercise plays on creativity, like the immediate oh, impact, yeah. whether it's whether it's running or biking or hiking or anything like that. But then <laughs> there are the mundane activities, and especially in the past couple of years, mundane activities being home. So you, I've not heard mowing the lawn, but here's what I've heard. Vacuuming, chopping vegetables, cleaning, folding clothes, uh you name it you know the mundane activity that requires no brain power seems to be where people get their best ideas um and i and i kind of always like to quote authors and i've got this quote here actually by i'm going to read it because i wrote it down today agatha christie said the best time to plan a book is when you're doing the dishes right so yeah where do you how often does i guess what are your thoughts on that? Do you get a lot of ideas when you're in, in, during those mundane times? Definitely. Those times are so valuable. You know, it's like, uh, especially it is a weird thing with motion. You know, when I'm driving, I guess it's maybe like a cinematic thing or something like that. Or when I'm running or it's like this, you know, it's just, it's, uh, but the, there's definitely a thing with motion, but yeah, just the mundane activities definitely help too. I like, uh, I've been working on making a video recently and I, so I've had clips of me like whatever, walking around in the snow, trying to sort out light and stuff like that. When I listen back, it's like stomping, but in every single one, I'm like, I'm whistling every one. And I realize, so very subconsciously, uh, and I've started noticing this that I've been constantly doing that. And I think it's just like a, it's a, it's a tick when you're, when you're doing something and your mind is occupied otherwise, if you, if you are, you know, it's a great way it's it's it generates generates ideas somehow magically who knows but it's it's yeah it definitely happens with me so is there a ritual you know i have certainly have rituals in my process time of day place because i know that those are the times and the places where it's happened for me before so right. i return to those and that to me it's a matter of confidence but i definitely have a ritual so how much of a how much is ritual a part of your your songwriting process I would say it's not that big a part of it, really. I mean, I think with it, 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 you know, varies from like from record to record. 
But I don't do the thing where it's like, okay, I'm gonna have my cup of coffee and be uh, be there at six thirty in the morning and work for. Two. I don't. I don't do. I mean, I work every day. I'm in my studio every day. Uh, you know, but a lot of it is like, like I said, like the essence of the ideas comes doesn't come from when I'm work sitting in my studio. The studio is the fun part when I'm, whatever, polishing off the rhymes or like putting. A, you know, editing, you know, editing is such a huge part of what I do. So like, or, or like recording or demoing or figuring out arrangements. So that that's all like the, that's really the the, the fun part kind of. Um, and, uh, but yeah, as far as a ritual, like, no. I, I mean, I, I, I work, like I said, I work daily, but as far as the ritual to get, to get ideas to come into you, I don't do that. I, I do mow the lawn a lot though. <laughs> so there's no sense yeah that that's you don't find that that as someone who's you know who is a songwriter by by you know by trade you don't find that that's a little anxiety producing so you're just willing to say okay when the ideas come that's when i'm going to sit down i mean uh yeah i mean i do like commercial work too so i get assigned yeah. things too which is actually is so therapeutic for me uh and i and i love doing that it's such a it's a similar part of my brain uh, and I have to do like the rhymes and I have to do this. There are a lot of things that I have to do. And it also makes me like pay more attention to my recordings. So, yeah, because for me, at least I'm like a morning person. I know that it's some, and there's also like, I never write and revise in the same chair. Uh, I like to. Oh, really? To, okay. to, yeah. Um, I just feel like those are different. And I also notice that the writing is also different, you know, depending on the room or the place or something like that. Um and I use that to my advantage, I guess, thinking right. about, you know, if I'm in a rut, like I'll move to another chair or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything like that. You know, like I just, um, my brain doesn't really work like that. I just, hmm. uh, but like I said, I write a ton, I'll write it, I'll write a ton. Once I, once I have the idea, I'm like, I, this is a good idea for a song. I like this. Uh, and I have like the sort of imagery and I have like sort of a rhythm or something or, um, or like a little guitar thing. I'll write a ton, you know, and then then the, so much of the work that I do is, is is the editing. I think that's sort of the a lot of the art of what I do is, is the editing and the sort of shaping of it. Now, when you say editing, how much editing are you doing and revising or doing to your do you do to your lyrics? Like a lot. I mean, I try to write quickly. I try to be a very free writer, and then uh, and then then a really harsh editor, you know, so I hmm. can. Uh, so like every song, not every song, but I'd say most songs have have many more verses than wind up on the on the record or. Um, yeah. And so it, it's a matter of of shaping it once I have like the big blob of stuff that I that I that I like the, the essence of it's it's a matter of just sort of chiseling away and, and making it into something that feels uh, feels really great. Yeah, I know that for me, Elmore Leonard has this quote and he says, if it's I think it says if it sounds like writing, rewrite it. Sure, uh, yeah. you know, in other words, like if it sounds like a cliche or a derivative, you probably heard it somewhere before. Um, yeah, I mean, I work very hard. It's very important to me to sound like I, the way that I talk, you know, sometimes I sort of slip up and I'll, and I'll try to sound, like I said, like whatever, it's smarter, they were more poetic or whatever than I actually am. And, and, but, and I always regret it, you know, like I heard hmm. a song of mine came on recently and I was like, it just bugs me, you know, to hear myself sounding like I'm trying to sound poetic when it would be just, it would have the exact same effect to just say it like I want say it like I say it. So I, I really do um, uh, try not to fall into that trap, you know, and I, I just want it to sound like a person talking as conversational as possible. That's why I sing like that too. Do you see, so I know you have kids. Uh, we yeah. have four kids okay. and, and uh, I know that having kids had made, has made me more disciplined writer because I just don't have any time. You know, if you had said to me pre kids, whenever that was, you know, uh, you got two hours, I may not, you know, a free time. I don't know what I do with that, but if I have two, right. if I have two hours now, I know that I've got to get this done. So do you find that having kids has made you more disciplined writer in general? I mean, you know, it's it has made me sort of keep my eye on the ball. I think a lot more as far as as making sure that I'm, you know, my career is going the way I want it to go. But I think more than anything, it's made me sort of given me the confidence to, or, or made me feel like I don't really give a shit about a lot of the things that I think I would have given a shit about when I was younger. 
Mm -hmm. um, like whatever, trying to be cool or trying to uh, whatever, anything. I, I think it's it's allowed me to feel like you know if I'm gonna write uh, this, I do this is what I do is I do music and I write songs. I'm gonna do it. I want my kids to be proud of me. I'm gonna do it. You know, in, in, a, in an honest and open way, and and try to be a positive force in the world, and you know, and uh, and and something that would be valuable to, to them and to you know to our family. So so I, I do. I, I do think in those terms, you know. So I read this study recently about Salvador Dali. Oh no, it was he was a part. He was they referenced him in the study about the role that sleep plays in the creative process, and so not not you know waking up after eight hours, but what they talked about, and they actually just it's in a study where they found that the period right before sleep, so in the period between being awake and dozing, there's that like whatever there's a term for it, where you're in that state of mind where you're kind of conscious, but not really. And so they told the story about Salvador Dali, how he would sit in an uncomfortable chair with a skeleton key in his hand. And then with a, um, like a, a plate underneath him. And when he fell asleep, the key would drop, land on the plate, wake him up. And he would start to feverishly create. Cause he found that that was a moment when he was instead as most productive. And some songwriters have told me that, you know, just in that moment before they fall asleep, whatever it is, there are this stuff happening in the brain. So I'm curious if that ever happens to you um, in those moments or maybe during sleep or anything like that, when that you, you know, you have those moments of intense creativity. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't necessarily, maybe, maybe when I was younger, I did, but as I'm getting older, like I'm just tired, you know, <laughs> at that hour. So I hear you. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily feel that creative, you know, actually the other night I rarely, usually I, I work regular, like I, 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 I stopped working up here at like whatever, five o'clock. But the other night I had something that I had to do. And, uh, so I was up here till whatever, 10 o'clock. And, you know, it's just like the next day I was like, you know, I just can't do that. I'm not good. <laughs> I'm not good at that hour. I'm not. I was actually up here till midnight. But after seven o'clock, eight o'clock, I'm, I'm just not good. I'm certainly not creative. I think I can trick myself into thinking I'm being creative, but I'm not. And the next day, you know, I'm just like, this is just garbage. Hmm. Um, I weirdly find that if I have a I've always found this it's not a great thing, to, but it, the, um, that if I'm hung over. I have my, I'm very creative. I have heard that. So let's, I, you're not the first person to say that I haven't, I've not asked that question in a while, but I'd love to hear why you think that is because there, when I ask songwriters, like what's the ideal emotional state when they get their best writing done, some of them saying hung over. So why is that? I don't know. I think because you have some of the, some of the looseness that you get from alcohol, but you're not like drunk. Like I, I if I tried to write something and I'd had a few drinks, it would be terrible. I would, I would, like that just doesn't work for me but the the hungover thing yeah you're a little like i don't know what it is you're just a little loose things just make it's it's i, I it's a great state of mind actually i really like it i wish you could just instead of being drunk you could just be hungover um but i i that does it is very helpful for me actually the song that i uh the song on the record called baseball diamonds uh, which is the first song that I wrote that was, I was just so bummed. I could not figure out any, I could not, I was just like sort of, and that wasn't writer's block, but I think it was just like getting the commercial songwriting stuff out of my system. And uh, and it was bothering me. And then um, I was very hungover and I had this guitar, I had a guitar part that had been lying around that I thought was just going to die. And then suddenly I sort of put that song together on a very hungover Saturday morning. And, uh, and that really kickstarted the record. So I, I can, it still does work for me. The, the answer I get is, I think songwriters tell me that it's you're you're all you're in your head. Like that's all you feel is your head, and when your head hurts, you're not you're not focusing on external stimuli. You're just kind of aware of your brain more. It's this weird right. state of mind, but it's so funny you say that because I've heard that, right. uh, and no one can explain why because it doesn't make sense. Like you're in pain, how can you create when you're in pain? But oh my gosh, that's so funny you say that because. Yeah. That has come up a lot. Um, do you do a lot of mixing and matching? You know, some songwriters tell me you got the lyrics here and the music here, and maybe they're in the notes. You know, how much do you say, oh, you know, I need some lyrics from this, you know, let me go through the notes app or anything um, and see what fits with the music that I have there. 
I mean, not so much with lyrics, but I will take, I do have like a, like a, like a lot of, of music or like guitar parts or things like that, that I, that I really need to organize better, but I'm aware of the ones that are, are really, that I really believe in a lot. So I'll, if I have a, an idea for like a song that's like a lyrical, you know, th- th- my ideas for a song always come from a lyrical idea. So I'm like, I, I have a, I want to do a song like that's a, about blah, 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 that has this kind of rhyme scheme and has, says it in this way. Um, and then, uh, then I'll be like, so excited about it that, uh, cause it, that's the, for me, that's the real, that's the big exciting moment is when I have that idea and I'm like, I, I love this idea. Um, hmm. I'll be so excited about it that I, I, I don't want to sit down and like try to, I, sometimes I'll do that. I do do that where I'll figure out the music right there on the spot or just simple chords. But off, often I'll be so excited about it. I'll just do one, make it one, four, five or something. Just, just too simple. Uh, which which is fine, which I do do that sometimes. But um, but if I like, you know, I had this beautiful guitar part from like two months ago. Like, let me just see if I can put them together. So I will do that. Um, but I, but I rarely go the other way. I really have like a sort of music that I like, and I'm like, okay, I should find, I should piece together words. It's always it's always the other way. So I interviewed uh, Daniel Lanois a few months ago, and and he talked about how when he writes lyrics, they're on 18 by 22 piece of art paper Uh and there's thought bubbles and there's arrows and there's words everywhere. In other words, he's not a linear songwriter at all. Uh, There's no, and I'm the same way. Like my, my first drafts of any writing, it's all over the place. There's no linear form. And, and I've got this, uh, there's a quote here by, and again, I wrote this down today because I wanted to ask you about this by E.L. Doctorow, the, the, the novelist, he said, writing is like driving at night. You can only see as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess what I'm asking is do, and it sounds like you do though, if I heard you correctly, that you do think about, you know, you think about, I'm going to write a song about this and you have a pretty good idea before the song starts of what it's going to be. I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, like I I think more so in the past, you know, uh, like, um, but with, with this new record, I think, and with maybe the, maybe in the last five years, I've been more sort of just writing and seeing where it goes. I still like to have, you know, so I'm trying to think. Sometimes I'll have, I, I like to have a, there aren't that many choruses on this record, though, either. but sometimes I'll have like a chorus line, you know, a, a, like a, a title, a title line, which, I, which is nice, which is helpful, you know, because then you know where you're, you know where you're going to get, you're getting to. Um, and then you can figure out sort of fun ways to try to say it in the verse. Um, so I like that, but I, I don't think I did that very much on this record. This record, I, I did. I feel like I did write it in a different way, where it was more, yeah, like like the 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 headlights quote, where it's more not exactly sure where it's going, um, and I sort of sort of let it go in and, and, and directions that I usually probably wouldn't. I usually want it to be more clear. You, I usually I, I really love clarity in in, in what I'm writing. Uh, so I, I like people. I like to be like like a modern country singer, where like you listen to it, and you know exactly what the person's talking about. You're just you're interacting with a human being, and you know exactly what they're saying. But I I, I did I did less of uh, less. It was, I think this record is less direct somehow. Um, on the new album, what was the easiest song to write? Is there a song that stood out as being one that just was? the fastest, maybe the most enjoyable that it stands out as being the easiest one. And then the, the next part of that is, is there one, what was the hardest one that maybe you wanted to give up on, but you pushed through? Um, the easiest one was, I'm trying to think, uh, I can't even remember. I mean, the, actually that baseball diamond was one that I wrote pretty hungover. It came very quickly. I mean, it took a lot of editing and it, the recording, it was a total pain in the ass for some reason. Um, but, uh, that one actually really came so quickly. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it was a reaction to writing a lot of commercial music re- right before that. And I wanted that, you know, that's super like, you know, snappy. Uh, and I wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to just write, have tons of words and have no chorus and just, just so, you know, that had a lot more verses. So, so I, but I did, I wrote it very quickly uh, and, uh, because uh, I had the guitar part, the guitar part I wrote right, right at the beginning of COVID, uh, and then uh, so that yeah, that came, I say that was the easiest one, even though there was a lot of editing. Um, the hardest one is probably the one called "The Bear," which is the title track, which is like um, I just really like the 
the idea, like the structure of it. You know, I, I don't think I've ever had a song before where it's like a, it starts with like a structure, but I liked, I liked the, uh, I liked that it talked about sort of a mythical creature or, or like a, you know, a real life story, sort of mythical kind of combination. And then it's very realistic. And then, you, then the mind wanders and it's sort of different stories come into play. And then, then the, then the bear appears at the very end. Uh, so I just sort of liked that. Uh, I liked that structure. And so I, but it took, and, and I had a really shitty, when I first was doing it, I had the idea of what we were just talking about. I, I put on a, like a guitar part and melody that I, that I kind of liked. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to use this. So I wrote the whole song around it and, uh, and then ended up being like a drag, you know, it was like the melody was bad. The rhythm, it just wasn't good. So yeah, I always play for my stuff for my wife. She was like, yeah, I just, I really like these songs. I just don't, I don't like the bear. The bear song is just a stinker. <laughs> you know, it was probably like 10 minutes long. I had this long story about this trip that I took one time um, that I thought was funny, but it wasn't, it wasn't very funny. Uh, so yeah, then, and then, you know, then I put it, I, I guess I changed the chords and I put a beat on it and, uh, and, and I changed the melody and then I figured out how to make the lyrics work. And then, then it all came together right before I went to LA to record. Um, so I was very thankful because uh, I really, I really do like that one. So Hemingway also said that all artists, all writers, should go to art galleries to be inspired. Mm -hmm. um, so how off? So I guess as a song, because some songwriters do tell me they find art galleries to be inspiring. Actually, as song, totally. so, do you? Yeah. So how? Or I guess are you inspired? Does that is that one way for inspiration for you? And I guess do you think that that's in general, songwriters can be inspired by other types of art. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I think I'm more inspired, especially with this, this stuff, but I think with all my stuff, um, I think I'm more inspired by other art forms than by, by music and, uh, and, and like songwriting. Um, like, yeah, definitely visual arts for sure. I mean, especially on this record, I had like uh, so much visual art. There's a lot of visual art references, a lot of references to painting. I used to paint when I was like in, in high school. So there's a lot about that just in about like the creative process as a whole and about like all the, a lot of imagery comes from, from, from art and from paintings. Um, so that, that really is a, a, a major source of inspiration for me, but also movies, you know, really like movies, uh, like good movies and even bad movies, but movies definitely, uh, and like just the dialogue, you know, and, uh, and like the humor and, and just like the feelings of certain movies, it definitely, uh, yeah, I definitely inspire me a lot. And, and I, I hear when I listen to my stuff, I, I can definitely recognize, okay, I, I remember when I did that line, that's from, that's because I saw that movie and that's, or that's because of that painting. It's, it's rarely like, oh yeah, that's like, you know, whatever, the Randy Newman's third record or something like that. I could see how movies would do that because the dialogue might inspire you, you know, the characters, but what about art, visual art? Uh, and again, the, you're not, yeah, go ahead. I guess it's just the, like the imagery. I, you know, I just like to have, uh, you know, it's just, and it's also the mystery of it and the pro, you know, on this record, I have like a song uh, called, well, like, there are two songs that sort of talk about abstract art, I guess. There's one called New Green and there's one called The Song Is Never Done, both of which are sort of, uh, sort of about art making. Well, not really, one of them is. Um, and I guess it's just sort of the mystery of it and the, and the mystery of like why, we do this and the mystery of like what why whatever an abstract piece of art with different colors next to it with a little piece of pink down in the bottom and blah 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 like can it be so moving and and sort of it's just i guess sort of an existential art art reflections on art uh kind of kind of thing that i definitely find, find myself doing a lot especially during covid uh so yeah those those sorts of ideas uh, definitely made their way into into the record, and, you know, and that's why I use this woman's uh, Hollis Heckmer, who's the, the the beautiful painting that I, that I used for the album cover. Yeah. All right. So last question. So I do find that songwriters are pretty voracious readers. Uh, so how much reading do you get to do, and and does that ever inspire you in your songwriting? Who are some of your favorite writers? I guess. I mean, you know, I've, during COVID, especially, I've been doing, doing a lot of poetry. Um, I haven't read that much great and, and a lot of nonfiction, you know, so that's that's been a little bit different. Um, I did reread. It's funny. I, I read reread Catcher in the Rye like maybe two months ago, three months ago. 
And I was like, holy shit, I'm totally copying his. I, I didn't realize, but I was like reading and I was like, that's kind of the voice I do. I was like, I've I, 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 I realized how I, I, had, I hadn't read it since I was probably in high school or whenever one reads right. it. Um, and I, I, I just suddenly was like, wow, that's very, that's the voice, that's the voice that I like, you know? Cause I remember reading it as a kid and being like, I feel like this person is just like talking to me, you know, it feels just so conversational. Uh, and, and I guess that really sunk in, you know? What would make you, okay, wait, first of all, did you say you're reading poetry or writing poetry? A reading. Okay, what do you, uh, listen, I'm all for songwriters reading poetry, but I could probably count on one hand the number who said they read poetry. Um, right. Which always, yeah, I mean, none of them do. No one. I mean, literally I, five or 10 of the 200 I've interviewed say, yes, I read poetry. Um, so, yeah, does poet, who are some of your favorite poets if you, and if you remember? And then how does, does that inspire you as a songwriter? Because some people say, well, it's a different type of writing, so it doesn't inspire me at all. But I mean, like, I guess during, during COVID, I think it's because of like a, like a shortened attention span from like anxiety, but like reading poetry is sort of a digestible nugget, you know? So it's, it's a similar to the, 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 the tone that I like in that whatever. And, and, uh, JD Salinger is that sort of, I really like this guy, uh, Charles Simic. And yeah, this guy, great and, poet. yeah. Yeah. And Raymond Carver. I really love like, think of those two right off the bat. It's just like, um, just so convers it's just conversational. It sounds very, it, it's sort of, it just, it's very conversational, very like approachable. And I don't know if, it's, if the ideas are approachable, but the language is so approachable and it just feels I, well, I, it's hard to explain why, why I yeah. love it so much, but it really just somehow just knocks me out. Um, and then I also, during COVID, read a lot of William Carlos Williams, just which is sort of the opposite. Um, and it's it's another thing that's just sort of magical. When you read it, you're just like, it's kind of like abstract art. It's like I don't like why the hell is it, why the hell is this so wonderful? But it's but somehow it is. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I find him in particular during COVID, I was like, this guy is just magical. I love it. I think it's amazing. I, I mean, th because what they do is they take ordinary objects. I mean, that's what the metaphysical poets did. They took ordinary objects and wrote about them in a way. And that's what good poets do, right? I mean, I interviewed the poet, uh, this is like 10 years ago, the poet Lee Young Lee, who's one of my favorite poets. And um, he said that he wrote a poem about how or when he wakes up, he sees the outline of he of 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 his body and his wife's body in their bed sheets. Now, most people just see messy sheets, but he wrote a poem about the outline of the bodies in the bed sheets when he wakes up in the morning. And I thought that's why he's a poet and I'm not because right. he saw the beauty in that. Um, but I love that. I mean, Charles Simic, William Carlos, Carlos Williams. Um, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, but most, yeah, it, it, I do not hear that very often. I think it's because I had a friend in high school who, who was really into it. We actually met Charles Simic. We went to see him speak in D.C. at the, where would he have spoken? At like the Folgers? Politics and Prose, maybe? No, it wasn't at a store. It was at like a, such a blur. I, I think it was at the, the Shakespeare, Folgers Shakespeare Theater or something like that. Yeah. And we went up to him afterwards and said, and said hi. And I remember we said, my friend Stuart said, it was right when we were really into Tom Waits. And he was, we were like, hey, and he was like, hi. And we were, um, Stuart was like, do you like Tom Waits? And he was like, of course I like Tom Waits. Everybody likes Tom Waits. And that, that, that was the extent of our conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's, there are, there's so much great poetry out there. Unfortunately, I think it's a, uh, you know, I, I when, when a poet dies, like there aren't, I think the last poet, I think I, I mentioned this to someone when Seamus Heaney died, uh -huh, yeah, that, yeah. that made the front page of, you know, every major newspaper, but uh, that's a dwindling number like right. of poets who, when they die, will get front page, uh, front page obit in a major newspaper. Right. Yeah. It's um, a weird gig. It's a, it must be such a hard, uh, we have actually, actually have a family friend uh, who, who I had heard about, but I had only met recently and he's a poet. Uh, and I was like, you know, he calls himself a poet. He's like, I'm a poet. I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, and he like said, he, he recently, I just, we, it's sitting on my kitchen table. He just sent us his book uh, or, one, or his most recent book, uh, you know, and it's just such a noble thing to do and to embrace it and have the 
nerve to say I'm a poet. It's just it's pretty cool, you know. Uh, but I would never have the nerve to do that. It's it's, it's a lot easier to, to hide behind, a, you know, guitar. And you mentioned so I, I'll tell you the songwriters or the writers that come up most often: Raymond Carver, uh-huh. uh with songwriters. Raymond Carver, I gotta remember the list. Raymond Carver, Cormac McCarthy, uh-huh. Kurt Vonnegut, Charles Bukowski. Uh-huh. Those okay, are the same, great. you know. And and it's I think you mentioned it's the commonality of the language. It's the simple yeah. language. It's the yeah. It's simple, but it's not simple. I mean, it's layered and it's meaningful, but but it those four always come up. Uh-huh, um, right. I get those, that. yeah. But I, I just have to ask. I'm fascinated by what made you pick up a catcher in the rye. I mean, that's not a normal. I mean, we all read in high school, but what made you say I'm going to go back and read that book? Uh, because I uh, I had I guess my mom gave me her old edition of it, so she has like the hardback, like the her old one, whatever from the when did that book come out? In the late fifties or something? 60s? I think so. Yeah. Uh, so she gave me that. Uh, you know, just because we had just, we moved, and I, I think I was, it was just lying around, so I just ch- checked it out. And that's it for the latest episode of Songwriters on Process. Don't forget, you can find all of my interviews with over two hundred songwriters on my Songwriters on Process website at songwritersonprocess.com, going all the way back to twenty ten. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.